if we have stragglers, that's fine. So I, um, I'm Kat Redness. I am the chair of the Green Mountain Book Award, and you guys are here to hear about the 2013-2014 list. Um, we mix it up a little bit. We're going to show you kind of um, some thematic presentations, some strategy presentations. So you're going to get some kind of skills and tools, but you're also going to hear at least a little bit about each of the 15 books. So I'm going to have you guys introduce yourself. Just say who you are. Um, if there's any information you'd like to give about yourself, that'd be great. Um, I'm, I also, I'm a public librarian. I work at Brownell Library. I'm the young adult librarian there. I have also been a teacher in the past. So. I'm Erica Adams. I am the librarian at Lake Region Union High School. I'm Jessica Langlois. I am from Rutland, and this is my sixth and last year on oh. GMBA. Oh. Uh, I'm Matt Swinson. I am a licensed English teacher for secondary education. Uh, this is my second year. Yeah. So. Awesome. Um, OK, so first I want to talk to you a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit. Oh, that's frustrating that the top is cut off, but that's okay. Um, so I, this year we changed a few policies on GMBA that I just wanted to talk to you about because we've got a couple things. We now um, have changed paperback availability. We used to say that books had to be available in paperback and we've changed that, which also means that we um, are going to have more current books, books that are available right away because we used to have to wait for the paperback date. So that's something that's really fresh. It's going to bring newer, more current books. We're not going to have to wait several years um, to wait till they're out in paperback availability. So um, that's really great news, and we're really excited about that. So look for a list that's really current. Uh, we're hoping to get books number one in a series before number three is out because we don't have to do that anymore. Um, we've also changed our publication date. We used to have books within the last five years. They're now within the last three. So this is going to kind of make the list more contemporary and modern, and we're really excited about that. Um, one thing that we did this year, which is the first time we ever did this, we had a teen on our committee this year. Um, Sarah was wonderful. She's been on it for two years, but uh, we kind of, she was our little pilot program, and we are now changing that, so we have two spaces for teens on our committee now. Um, her insight was really invaluable. She brought a, a very new and fresh perspective to to it, um, had some great book suggestions, so we're excited to continue that tradition and welcome teens onto the list if they, they choose to apply, and so we're very excited about that. Um, that being said, we have, t we have some openings on the committee. Um, we are looking for three adults. We have three adult positions due to people leaving the end of their term. Um, and we're also looking for two teens, and there's still time to submit applications. So if you're interested, you can submit an application to the wonderful Grace Green sitting in the front row. That is her, her, um, that's her information right there. Or you can go to the Department of Libraries website. And we are looking for applications by June 1st. Um, and I just want to tell you quickly about applications. We ask that you submit two um, book reviews, one positive, one negative, about YA books. Um, for adults, we're asking that you submit a resume and cover letter. For teens, we've actually created an application, which just asks them a few questions about their reading habits, their interests, and about their availability. Um, so we would love if you work with teens. Um, they should be in high school. That's really. And, and be able to get to meetings and, and be able to handle that reading load. So if you have any questions, you can ask Grace or I about that, absolutely. Do just one, just, is there anything else that you can tell us about the committee, what, how, how often you Sure, meet? sure, absolutely, that's a great question. So the committee meets several times throughout the year. We meet um, August and October are when we bring book suggestions to the table. So each committee member brings book suggestions, whether they've garnered that from, um, from their community, from teens they work with, or whether they're doing their own independent reading of that. We start reading after August, but then you can still submit more books in October. Um, we meet in January, and at that point, um, three readers have read every book suggested. Um, and we meet and we talk about all those books, kind of giving them yes or no's, talking about why we would put them on the list. Um, we then put them forward if they get all yeses. And so those become required reading, which the entire committee then reads. Um, and by that point, it's normally a list of, I would say, between 40 and 60 books. So you've read some of those, and then you're reading some that you haven't, you haven't had the opportunity to read. And so that's in January. And then in March, we have a full day meeting. And that's where we decide the list of 15. So that's when we go through all the required reading. We break it down. Um, we look at kind of the, the, the balance of the list. OK, do we have too much of this, too little of this? Do we have books 
for this demographic. Um, and so we submit that. And then we have a meeting in June to talk about any business, if we need any new people on the committee, if there's things that we want to change, look at policies. Those are things that we, that we talk about in the June meeting. So it's not, and normally besides the March meeting, um, the meetings are about two hours. They're normally in the afternoon. However, there's you know, leeway, and we, we make sure as many people as possible are available when we have those times. Okay? All right. So big exciting news, which is great. Sue Monmini, who works at Montpelier High School, has created a website for GMBA. Right now, uh, GMBA is embedded within the Department of Libraries website. And so Sue created a separate website that has some more interactive capabilities. And I'm just going to go to it right now. So it's a Google site. and. Um, Basically, what this does is it has all the lists, all the previous lists. It has links for all the books. Sue has also linked this to Goodreads, so there are reviews. People can link to the reviews. This will also link to all our social media. Um, you can go to Twitter and use the hashtag GMBAVT, Vermont, uh, VT, which Eric is going to talk a little bit more about. Um, and each of these is an active link, so you can go on these. This will link to the Goodreads site which will then give you, you know, reviews on the book. You can look and have all these different options there. Additionally, on here, um, if anybody doesn't know, and there's still time to submit student votes, we have voting forms now that you can submit electronically. Either students can vote independently, they can submit their own votes, or if you would like to collect the votes as a library media specialist or as a librarian, um, you can go ahead and submit that right there. We also have information about GMBA. The downloadable resources are still there. Um, former list, book suggestions. So there's a lot of options on here. One thing that I would love and that Sue has asked me, and I'm just going to bend and take this down, is what you would like to see on this site. Sue is wondering, because she's still developing this, this is still very new, um, and it's, this is the first year we're doing this, is there anything that you would like to see on GMBA as professionals on this website that you think would be helpful both to you, to your students, to teachers who might be using this site? Any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I have a teacher right now who's using this year's, this coming year's list and this past year's list with students. They've each chosen a book and they're making book trailers. Oh, nice. I'd like to be able to send students who want to share theirs to you and have that featured on the site. So it's, not, it's actually already there. Yes. Yeah. If you look on the individual book pages, there's a book trailer there already and it says we want student trailers. Excellent. There you go. So there you go. You've got it right there. You've got book trailers that already exist. I know. Oh, Sue's oh, so listening right now. She just did it. She just did it. You're all set. Well, see, she was asking me to check things to make sure they looked right while she was doing it. We were on Google Chat. And she's like, oh, look at it now. Does it look better? So I already you know what's on there. Excellent. There you go. Yep. So over here, you're going to get links that are the individual books, and that's content that's already there. And then if you link to them on that front page, that'll bring you right to the Goodreads. So. Okay, yeah. Any other thoughts of things you'd like? About book trailers, or is that about just the book? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's under A Monster Calls the Book. Every mm -hmm. every single book has a page like this. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yes. I so if you know. go over here to the oh, left, oh, yep, so you go Anna Dressed in Blood, you're going to get, okay. you know, a little bit of information awesome. to the book. Okay. And there could be additional content. And that's the question is, what additional content would you guys be okay. interested in? Is there anything beyond what's here that you guys would be interested in us adding to these pages? And did kids make these trailers? These, I know the one on the Monster Calls, that I think was a professional one. So, okay. but absolutely, if, if there are kids' book trailers, that would be great, too, so. Okay. Other books by the same author. And that's really easy. So that's already material that we create for the handbook. So that's great that it would be more easily accessible for you right there. We, we if, for those of you who don't know, we create a handbook every year. The committee members create a handbook. One of the things they do are additional books by this author. Another are, if you loved this book, here are other books you might want to explore. So those would be great things. Those are really quick, accessible things. Anything else? Maybe book reviews. Book reviews. Like professional or student. And it's okay. If there's anything, if you want to explore the website, if there's ever any feedback, you can give that to Grace, to myself, or to Sue Monmini, and she'd be happy to hear that. So, yeah. I just thought of something. We could have like a little rater button at the bottom of everything, and then you could rate that current book, like five stars or something. 
Awesome. And I think part of that is if you go right to Goodreads, it'll do that will give that, but it'll okay. be it would be interesting to explore that option right directly on this too. So anything else before we move on to this year's books? Okay. <laughs> So as we, so that's great. And Sue Monmini has been amazing. And I just want to really give, give a shout out to her for her diligence about doing this. She's also committed herself to not only creating this site, but maintaining it. So we're super appreciative of all her hard work. And so um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without her. So um, let me get back into here. Wonderful. OK, so just before Erica starts, I just want to quickly say one thing that I love to remind people about GMBA is our, our goal is to get great books for pleasure reading for high school students. So a lot of these books are going to be fun. They're going to be a little bit devious, but they're all going to be really high quality. So um, so it's a really nice balance, and we have a lot of fun selecting these books. So that's a great thing to remember. If, you, if you're looking for a kid who's a reluctant reader, there's going to be something on this list for them. If you've got a really strong reader, there'll be something there for them, too. All right, Erica. You want me to click for you? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about ways to promote the books, but also three of the books that are on the list. Um, Twitter, I'm sure everyone knows by now, uh, is an awesome, imaginative, fun tool to use. Um, I'm kind of working on a theme of fun and fantasy in this year's GMBA list. Uh, this is actually a real hashtag. How familiar is everyone with Twitter? Who, who's familiar? Raise your hand. OK, so I guess I'll just say, so hashtags are where you can search. You would put in on the search, when you go to twitter.com, there's a little search box at the top. You could enter the v, this hashtag, and it will pull up anything that people have tweeted that is related to Vermont GMBA. Um, we had to add the Vermont because GMBA actually has a lot of other uh, acronyms. So have the Vermont, or you'll find a bunch of other stuff. These I just made up for fun. Um, and you can do that. I mean, you'll see as we go on. I, I think students could have a lot of fun with hashtags and just with Twitter. Um, you have to be really creative, and you have to be really succinct if you're going to use Twitter, especially when you're trying to like promote a book, talk about its plot, try to talk about a character, make a conversation. So I found it challenging, and I was like, this is really fun. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> so why Twitter? Uh, it's fast in real time. It will have students, if they have accounts, one, you're teaching them some online safety and just account maintenance sort of stuff. But you can send out little tweets. They can get tweets immediately. And it's, it's fast and real data information. Uh, it's catchy. You have to be succinct. You can't really go on for ages and ages. And you won't lose the, the student's interest. And the students don't have to feel like pressure to write enormous amounts of words. It's, it's giving them a limit, and it makes you be creative. Uh, and it's social. I think if students already have Facebook or have some other social media connections, they can tweet and connect their tweets to those things. But I mean, the whole world is, is tweeting. Authors are on there, so you can kind of teach them how to make some professional connections um, using Twitter. Or um, even you as the librarian teacher, you can use it for your colleagues in a professional way. Um, you can promote library books through it. You can promote library events and activities. Literacy, I mean, there's, the possibilities are endless. Most times I feel like everyone hears about Twitter and they're like, I'm so bored. Can you please stop talking about what you ate for lunch? <laughs> but there's so many other uses. And so I, I think it would be really great for literacy and reading. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the first thing I did as a librarian is I made a school only slash professional Twitter account. I have my own personal one where I can say, hey, I just picked my nose. Yay. But on my professional one, I'm not going to talk about that. I will look at technology. I look at education chats. I look at library people, books, authors. So that's what I did. I would suggest you do the same if you want to use Twitter. Um, next slide, please. So then, to actually promote and get yourself seen and heard, you do sort of have to build some followers. If you're lucky and you have classes, you could have your students set up school accounts with Twitter and, and show them how to do that so that they're using professional names, that they're posting professional things, talk about why it's important to be respectful, all those kind of social media literacy kind of standards that connect with Common Core stuff. Um, and then teach them why they're going to follow you and how you're going to follow them. And then you're going to create like a little classroom pool of tweets. And I just said choose wisely because there's a whole bunch of crap out there too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and then you actually have to remember to tweet. You can't just make an account and then think people are going to like follow you. If you don't tweet at all, your students will get bored. If your students don't tweet, you're not going to see what they're doing or what they're reading. 
So just make sure you really actually use it as a tool. I've given you just a few ways that I think you could use it. You can tweet new releases from the library. You can do speed book talks, which you'll see I sort of tried to do, and it's really hard. <laughs> um, you can do character conversations. And people have already done this. I think there's Shakespeare and Twitter. And so people are already using this as a medium to express literary things, books, authors, characters, whatever. Um, books, plots through tweets, just a, like a little synopsis. You can do author questions. If you can find many authors already have Twitter, too, because they want that instant feedback update on their own books and on their own like self-promotion. Um, and you could get students to try to tweet to the authors and sort of try to engage in some like professional discussions. Um, and then student assignments. I've been trying to work with one of my English teachers. She does this thing where she has them like do these interactive um, plays or like they make a play and then they pretend to be characters from a book. And I've been trying to convince her, you could do this in Twitter. They could pretend to be Romeo and Juliet. How would they talk in tweets? Like how would that work for them? Um, so I think, and you could also have them tweet their favorite lines from the book. You could have them tweet words they didn't understand. And if you create the hashtags that we mentioned in the beginning, um, it can be a classroom hashtag. So it would be like, hashtag Miss A, English 2. Or it would be like, hashtag words I didn't understand. The hashtags would then allow you as the classroom teacher to search for every one of your students' um, tweets. And so it's really easy to kind of collect the data you would want from just your students. Because Twitter is a huge universe, but those hashtags are awesome. And I did just hear that I think Facebook is trying to now use the hashtag thing too soon, which would be kind of cool. Mm. Next slide, please. <laughs> so let's jump into the books. Anyone read The Night Circus? Yeah, oh it's so beautiful and amazing. <laughs> it's such a good book. So here's my attempt at a plot or slash book talk summary. Mystery. Circus freaks, magic equals the night circus. And so then I use these made up hashtags. And as you see, I had to make a correction. This is the correct hashtag. If you go search that hashtag, you actually will pull up my real tweets because um, I went back and fixed it because I had the wrong one on these. I'm just pointing it out so I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> but um, so mystery, circus freaks, magic equals night circus. Um, I then took out some really kind of, I thought, uh, loaded quotes. She's perfect, Chandra's remarks. Yes, sir, says Marco, the notebook in his hand, shaking slightly. Does anyone remember that moment? It's when he first saw her on the stage. Mm. Oh, so powerful. Uh, and the top one is recalling his distress after the audition. No, it's not a spoiler, OK. Yeah. No, no, none of these are spoilers. <laughs> and notice, I didn't use quotes. Because of that limit of the, word, the, the letter count, I actually couldn't even quote the book. I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? So I kind of had to just like paraphrase get the main points, um, but it worked. Um, I think someone would read this and be kind of like, what is this book about? Like, that's kind of interesting. And you can just go on and on. So this is more of like um, some good quotes that I think kind of give some um, loaded emotional scenes from the book. Next slide, please. Oh, do you want a synopsis? Could you back that up for me? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try to not give it away. But so Night Circus is literally about this traveling circus that only comes and performs at night. There's mystery. There's entry, there's a duel to the death. I don't think I need to say more. <laughs> there's next slide, please. There's a tent full of kittens. <laughs> <laughs> it is just the most magical, um, beautifully written. Um, I would say it's for higher end readers, um, but if you have some students who really like fantasy and um, may struggle a little, if they have enough time, I think any reader could read it, because I just gave it to sort of like a romancy fluff girl book reader, and she really loved it. And I was like, yes, score. Um, and again, I'm sorry if I, you forgot, I'm a high school librarian, so I, that's my connection with books. So the next one, The Scorpio Races by Rachel Hartman. Uh, has anyone heard of this book? Because I heard everyone wanted on GCS. By Rachel Hartman. Right? We're, we're did I put the wrong name? Oh my gosh, I did! Okay, it's Maggie Stiefelvader. So what happens when you copy and paste and don't look closely? Your mind doesn't see your mistakes. I apologize how unprofessional. But so, okay, by Maggie Steinfeinder. I don't even know how to say her name, but. Steve Fodder? Steve Fodder. Um, I feel like this was going to be a DCF book either last year or this year, but it didn't make it. And when we read it, we were like, this is the best book ever. Uh, it combines, like, Celtic myth. It combines, again, another, like, race to the death, this, like, competition-based thing. But there's also love and romance and coming of age. Uh, so I kind of did in this one more, uh, this is the book synopsis. Flesh-eating horses, 
boy meets girl, magic again, because I chose the fantasy magic theme, uh, equals the Scorpio races. And then this is just like a kind of another good quote I thought from the book. Peg Grattan turns around, writes my name on the list. Without a doubt, it's an image I'll never forget. And that's when she was signing up to be in these things called the Scorpio races. Um, and I pretty think, don't you think if you've read the book, Flesh Eating Horses, Boy Meets Girl Magic? It's pretty close, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to be like, how would I hashtag and find these things later? But you can be pretty creative. Next slide, please. And last but not least in my fun and fantasy call category, bless you, Thank you. is Serafina by the real Rachel Hartman. <laughs> I didn't write that other book. I apologize. Um, Serafina, has anyone read this book? Oh, nice. Oh, excellent. So it's kind of a new dragon book. And I hadn't been really familiar with like Aragon and other dragon series. So I kind of came to this like fresh off the dragon train. So I didn't have anything to compare it to. Um, I thought it was pretty engaging because it was like a futuristic, historical dragon magic world. Um, <laughs> And there's a war against good and evil involving the dragons, uh, and we don't know who will win. And there's some people set in their ways, and there are people who want to change. So you should read it to find out what happens. But my little synopsis for us is medieval times, humans that are dragons, and the magic equals Seraphina by Rachel Hartman. And then I kind of tried to find a quote that summarized it again, and it's, an entire garden had grown. Each avatar had its place in this garden of grotesques. I tended them every night, mm. Serafina. And so why I chose the theme of fun and fantasy is I think it really appeals to teenagers a lot. They're looking for escape sometimes, and they may not always want to admit that they want something fun and fantastical that includes magic because that's so lame, but they really do. I think it's one of the highest genres that go out of the library, and these books are kind of more mature and do it in less of a, like, um, obviously cheesy way, like the covers don't look like they're all about fantasy. They're, it kind of has, like masks the magic of it, but once you get them in there and say, yeah, there, there's some magic, but there's a lot of murder, mystery, intrigue, duels to the death, I think that they also get caught up again in just letting their imagination go. Um, and Twitter, combining those two things, really lets them be creative and just fun, and like funny and kind of snarky, um, so I think it's a good combination. And so now, I'm going to hand this over to Matt, and he will talk about what makes us scared. <laughs> Great. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Google's your friend. Um, so I got, I got to choose the uh, horror genre. Um, we can probably skip to the next one. Um, get the quick ones. All right, so what is horror? Um, so the thing about horror is that it's a little hard to peg down, especially in our books, because none of these books that I'm about to talk about could probably be described as like really scary, <laughs> but you never know. Um, that's so subjective. Um, so what makes you scared might not make someone else scared. If you're scared of zombies, other people use it as a bumper sticker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you might be scared of vampires, but then there's that thing. <laughs> um, so moving on. Um, thank you. Uh, it's malleable. It fits in a lot of different uh, other genres as well. Um, you have things like uh, science fiction. Um, I have no mouth and I must scream is a wonderful story, um, but also extremely scary, but it's also science fiction based, so it fits nicely in there. And fantasy with Neil Gaiman's core line. It's not really scary, but you know, there's some unnerving imagery in it. Um, which kind of fits in with the horror yeah. elements. It's That's the subjective aspect. <laughs> yes, yeah, so some people don't find that scary. I didn't find it scary, but yeah, some people do. So, uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, there, so, the three types of um, horror as set forth by Stephen King. Um, the first one, uh, yeah. uh, there's the gross out, which is the, you know, blood, guts, gore, fest type things that a lot of horror movies nowadays team, seem to like um, your hostels, your saws, all that stuff. Uh, the next one is horror. That's unnatural stuff. Um, this tends to fit well in fantasy because you got giant spiders, um, you know, unnatural creatures, H.P. Lovecraft type things, you know, cosmic beings from beyond the stars that are coming down to steal our sanity. <laughs> and terror, which is probably the most effective, you know, universal kind of thing, which is more of a unsettling feeling that you can't really place, 
Um, he says that it's when you come home and notice everything you own has been taken away and replaced with an exact substitute. Um, it's, it's just kind of a, a, a sense of dread, a, a feeling of, uh, yeah, so. <clears throat> and I think that's the most, probably the most effective. So the first book that I was uh, going to talk about is called The Name of the Star by Maureen Johnson. Uh, it's part one of The Shades of London. Unfortunately, every single one of these books that I'm about to talk about is part of a longer series. That seems to be a kind of a trend in young adult fiction. Um, it has both historical and modern elements to it. It's basically a story about a copycat killer of Jack the Ripper. Um, so there is gore involved. I didn't say that because I forgot. Um, and uh, so yeah, it, it, it kind of travels back and forth because it is about ghosts um, and you know people. Yeah, the, the ghost of Jack the Ripper kind of thing. Um, so it's a paranormal horror slash thriller, uh, but it does use the gross out a little, a lot. Um, but it also has horror elements. And of course, it's a young, it's a young adult book. It has to have romance and hope. Um, and I, on each of these books, I tried to think of things that if someone likes something, they might also like this book or the other books I'm going to talk about. So From Hell is a bit of a stretch, admittedly. Uh, that's the graphic novel by Alan Moore. Uh, it also deals with Jack the Ripper. Um, possessed by Gretchen McNeil and Anna Dressed in Blood, which is one of our other books that we have on our list. Um, this is The Dark Endeavor, as by Kenneth Opal. It is the first part of The Apprentice of Victor Frankenstein. Uh, obviously, Vic, uh, Frankenstein's story is a kind of staple of the gothic horror genre um, and one of my personal favorites. Um, it's a historical fantasy, it's set in uh, 1800s Middle Europe kind of place. Um, it has a dark romance element. I don't know if that's a real thing or yeah, if I made it up. Sure. I think I might have made it up by accident. Um, but uh, it's kind of, it's got a romantic element, but it's kind of a creepy romance, if that makes sense. Um, I'll go more of that in a little bit. Um, and it has a steampunk element because he, you know, deals with alchemy um, and things of that nature. Um, the basic story is that it tells like the early days of uh, Victor Frankenstein, his twin brother, growing up, and he goes on an adventure of sorts where he has to um, start using this dark art known as alchemy to try and save his brother from a disease. I don't think that spoils anything because that happens no, like the first like good. ten pages. Um, this one uh, deals with the horror and terror. Um, there's not a lot of gross out stuff. Um, the terror actually comes from the romantic angle. If that makes sense, <laughs> because you get this, he gets this growing desperation towards this girl he likes, and he starts doing increasingly darker, more creepy things to try and win her affection. Um, you read this if you like Frankenstein, because um, obviously, if you like Frankenstein, you might want to know what happens before that. Um, Harry Potter, just because of the going on an adventure, learning about magic, uh, and Bone Shaker by Sherry Priest, because of the steampunk elements involved. Uh, Hold Me Closer, Necromancer, also a very good book. Um, part one of the Necromancer series, hooray. Uh, Urban Fantasy um, is kind of a fantasy, you know, magic, stuff like that, set in a more modern era. Um, it deals with paranormal elements. It's also very funny, um, extremely entertaining to read. Um, it has gross out in it. Not too much, though, actually, surprisingly enough. You think they have more dealing with zombies and things like that. Um, the basic severed story, heads and, yeah. yeah, though there's one severed head, <laughs> to be fair. Um, uh, the basic story is that a young man um, learns basically that he is a necromancer, um, which is not, and not so much a profession, but more of a race, I guess. Um, so he, that's him learning what that means and how to deal with it and having to overcome a evil guy. Um, you would read this if you liked the TV shows Reaper or Lost Girl, since they deal with, you know, fairies and werewolves and vampires and things of that nature. Um, American Gods by Neil Gaiman has a similar uh, comedic bent, or humor. And the Need of Lake series, which is actually really similar to this, <laughs> when I think about it. Um, I don't know if anyone's read those before. Uh, you should probably stop after the fourth book, because after that it just becomes creepy. Um, <laughs> Sex and drugs and yeah. Anyway, thing. 
Um, sorry, I just sure. want to interlude one thing. Um, I just saw the sequel is called Necromancing the Stone, which I just think. <laughs> it also bears mentioning that every single uh, chapter title is the name, uh, is lyrics or the name of a you know, rock song or. Yeah. So there's a real cleverness to yeah. Lish McBride. Yeah. If you like punk. Yeah. Um, I Hunt Killers uh, by Barry Liga. I would say this is probably was the hardest sell on the committee. <laughs> uh, just because most people didn't like the fact that it was so gross out. There was a lot of violence and guts and gore and stuff involved. So if you have uh, a reader with a more sensitive uh, demeanor, you might not want to recommend this particular book. Um, it's a modern setting, uh, part one of the Jasper Dead series. Um, has a nature versus nurture element to it. Uh, the basic story is that a young man is raised by his serial killer father to also be a serial killer, but he goes his own way and then eventually tries to help uh, the cops find a copycat killer that is mimicking what his father used to do. Um, very gross out. Um, like I said, if you have a sensitive constitution, you might not want to read this book. <laughs> Uh, you would read this if you like Darkly Dreaming Dexter, which is the book that the TV show Dexter is based off of, which deals with a very similar kind of idea. A uh, guy's a serial killer, but tries to use it for good. Um, Croak by Gina D'Amico, which I believe is a young girl um, learning to become a Grim Reaper kind of figure. Uh, Dead Like Me, same actually uh, sort of story. All right, uh, Anna Dress in Blood is by Kendare Blick. Spell that right? That's right, right? Okay. Uh, part one of the Anna series, all right? Um, modern uh, setting. Uh, the basic story is that a young man kind of inherits a job from his father, which is hunting ghosts and paranormal kind of entities, um, which is why I say that if you like the supernatural, you would read this. Um, it's a paranormal fantasy, and of course, it's a romance element that is kind of weird. <laughs> Uh, as, as gross out horror, because it's it involves yeah, um, blood, violence. I'm trying to I'm trying not to give away no. plot points. So the, the the romance is weird. All right. So um, the basic story is that he he goes to this uh, house to um, take care of this uh, figure of a ghost that's dressed in blood as a blood covered dress. Um, she's killed everyone that goes into the house, but she leaves him alive, and it's him trying to figure out why and all that stuff. So you'd read this if you like Supernatural, because it's pretty much the a episode of Supernatural in a book form. Um, Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. Uh, Dresden Files deals with a wizard who um, deals with supernatural detective kind of thing, uh, and Haunting Violet by Alexandra Hart. All right. He has a lot of books. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, this year it seems like most of our books fell into the uh, what, what could be considered horror genre. So I've got a lot to cover. So that's why I'm kind of talking fast and trying to get through it. Um, this Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Riggs. That's a great name for an author. But um, it's part one of the Miss Peregrine series. Uh, it has a modern, but he kind of travels back and forth in time. It's weirdness. Um, paranormal Fantasy deals with uh, these this kid who goes uh, to an island off the coast of Wales and finds this abandoned um, place where these peculiar children were kept. Um, and he has to find out what's going on with that. Um, but the unique storytelling thing is probably the strongest uh, element of this book because it interle interweaves these creepy pictures of kids um, uh, and gives them captioning and works them into the story. Um, when one spoke to the other, no sound was heard. Could have could have whole conversations without saying a word. So um, there's also things like that. Uh, somehow she got into her head that she could communicate with the dead. So you see creepy pictures, and these are worked out throughout the whole story, and he uh, they work pretty nicely into the actual narrative. Um, you would read this if you like uh, a monster calls. Which I really believe we tried to get on the list, but is that, no, it's on. Is it on the list? Oh, I okay. will be talking about it in a moment. I thought it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> How did I not want to talk about that one? Anyway, it's in, um, the, it's in the cancer group. Not it's, the in the can it's in the cancer group. <laughs> okay. The other. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, which is also on the GMBA list. Um, <laughs> Borderline by Neil Gaiman has sort of similar creepy imagery, um, and everybody sees the ass by A.S. King, which is actually a story about. 
a Vietnam vet and stuff. So I think I'm done. Awesome. So I'm going to give it just now. <laughs> so Are there any questions? I did kind of go through that kind of quickly, and I apologize. All right. Yes. My only question is, can we access your slideshow? This is, this is going to be um, on Dynamic Landscapes. We're going to send this, yeah. So it's going to be all set, so you'll have access to all of these. And I just want to say thank you, Matt, for that. And I think it's, no, no, you're great. <laughs> Um, one thing that's really neat is, you know, I think there's there's very mixed feelings about Twilight, but if Twilight did anything, it really did kind of birth this new yeah. foundation of, of a horror genre, and there's some really cool stuff that's out there, and so, um, so Matt did a great job of highlighting that, and so they're really varied, you know, I mean, it is wild when we look at our list and we say, okay, six, maybe more, six plus of our books can be considered somewhat horrific. Um, but there's a lot being published out there, and, and it's really it's really great. So yeah. Honestly, most of those books I probably wouldn't consider true like, scary type things. Yeah. So. Hi, Jess. So I will be talking about the badass side of girly books. <laughs> we we noticed that in our list in our current list. Oh, shoot. Grace! <laughs> and you can't even deny that because it's your name! Please turn off your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> I am really sorry. No worries. <laughs> Jess, anyway, take it away. <laughs> we noticed going through our list that a lot of our books, whether they were written by female authors or they had like female protagonists, they, the girls are doing some really ass kicking things. So they are strong, severe, sly, and sassy, all these things, that's okay. So who is the most dangerous girl you know? Well, I can guarantee she's got nothing on these girls. <laughs> Whether we're talking secret agents, juvenile delinquents, or killer pageant princesses, these girls have got it all. <laughs> so I basically just have, I'm just going to read you a few quotes from the three books that I'm talking about so you can see examples of their actual badassness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a School for Dangerous Girls, um, this is about, there's this girl, Angela, and she got into some trouble. She accidentally did something pretty bad, and her parents just couldn't handle her anymore, so they send her away to this reform school that's just in the woods in Colorado and there's basically no way out and it's not your typical school. You kind of have to survive by your wits and your whatever, like whatever you can summon, whatever strength you can summon to help you survive. Um, what Angela says at some point in the book is a little self-hatred keeps a person interesting. So after she kind of, she kind of gets past the idea of trying to reform or trying to work her way out of the school, she realizes that she's going to have to I guess give in to the way the schools run and try to make the most of it. So that's the School for Dangerous Girls, Beauty Queens by Libba Bray. Um, this is not like anything. <laughs> There's nothing like this. Um, one of my favorite quotes from this book is, why do girls always feel like they have to apologize for giving an opinion or taking up space in the world? Have you ever noticed that, Nicole asked? You go on websites and some girl leaves a post and if it's longer than three sentences or she's expressing her thoughts about some topic, she usually ends with, sorry for the rant or that may be dumb, but that's what I think. So I just remember when I was reading this book, there's a lot in this book that's kind of, it can be considered cheesy or anything like that. Like it's funny, but it's also just kind of silly. Like you don't really take it seriously. But I just remember when I was reading that book, that's, it really resonated with me because that's the way a lot of teenagers think and a lot of girls are kind of bred to think that way. So this is about this pack of beauty queens. They're, they're on their way to a pageant and their plane crashes on this desert island and they basically have to survive. Um, so they try to maintain their beauty queen aspects of their personalities and their bodies and their lives, but they also, they find a lot of hidden resources inside themselves. Like one of the I don't want to give away too much, but one of the things I really liked was these girls have never been appreciated for their brains or for anything cool that they can actually do just for their beauty or their shallowness in a way, but they come up, one of the girls comes up with this way to filter water and purify water so that they have drinking water, and I just thought it was really cool because she 
never thought this was a skill she was going to use, and she was actually ashamed of being interested in science, so she kind of kept it secret for a long time, and then she finally was able to use it. So I just thought it was really nice. Um, and then another quote from the book is, just because you're funny doesn't mean you get to be cruel. So there was a whole... There was this whole competitive aspect among the girls at the beginning and really all the way through, but it was also, they also learned how to be friends and how to work with each other and things like that. It's Lord of the Flies meets the Miss America pageant. It is. There is a, there even references Lord of the Flies, which I thought was really cool, but it's, they even, they talk about how girls kind of do Lord of the Flies a little bit differently. Like, they don't, <laughs> like, they don't go the way that they go on the island in Lord of the Flies, basically. <laughs> So I thought that was really interesting. And Codename Verity is a really good book. <laughs> this is one of my favorites on the list. Um, it's, it takes place, it's during World War II, and um, there's a lot about the French resistance and things like that in it. Um, a secret agent crashes, her, or she, she basically gets captured in France, and she's held by the Nazis and she's, it's like all these double agents and like crossings and things like that. So she is writing out her story, her true confession or whatever, if you will. And she's, there's just a lot going on in the book and you don't realize, well, I mean, I didn't realize a lot of it until towards the end. Like there's just so much going on. Um, and what I liked, one of the quotes that I like from this book is, if I am very lucky, I mean, if I am clever about it, I will get myself shot here soon. So it just kind of shows how badass she is because she's like all in for her, for what she's doing in the war and the side that she's representing. So she's really just going for it and she is not afraid and she's not holding back. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Okay. So, so, so when, when I was assigning books, to people to present today. You know, Matt Matt got horror, and so we looked at a lot, and Erica got fantasy, and Jess got, got the great girl books. And I looked, and I said, okay, what's left? I'll present on what's left. And I said, I have all the books that are about dying of cancer. Um, so it's fun. It, it's not funny. That's an awful word to use. But sometimes it's very interesting when we look at kind of patterns that we have. Sometimes you have these, these coincidences of books. Last year, we get to the end of the list and we go, we have two books about girls getting sent away to boarding school in Paris, their senior year of high school, and resenting it. So you're like, how did that happen? That seems so funny that it happened. Um, this year we have three books that deal with very, and deal phenomenally well. Um, these are YA authors really treating the subject of cancer, whether it's somebody, somebody dying of cancer, whether it's somebody who is living with somebody dying with cancer. They handle it very, very well. And these are three really beautiful portrayals of what cancer can do and how cancer can affect the lives, um, the lives that it does. So I call this YA Explores the Big C. So this is probably one of the most well-known books on our list, The Fault in Our Stars by John Green. And the overall, the overarching kind of theme of this book is how will I be remembered and how will my life and will my death have meaning? Um, I think what's really unique about this book is that's a question that you ask regardless of whether you have cancer. I think especially teens are at a point in their life where they're starting to figure out who they are and what their identity is and how they're going to make their place in the world. And I think what this does is it turns it up a notch because you know that the time you're going to have to make that impact is that much less. So you have this really significant kind of life moment faced, faced with um, be, being faced with cancer. So the story is of Hazel and Augustus, two teens who um, both are in a cancer support group, and it's them meeting each other. They both have you know, terminal diagnoses, and so they're kind of trying to make sense of the world and, and make sense of each other um, in, in this. And there's this wonderful irreverence and sarcasm about it, but then this is also a really meaningful book about connection, about human connection, about how that can be kind of the biggest savior of all. Um, so. There's, there's definitely kind of a funny aspect of this and, and this the sarcasm of it. The first quote talks a lot about kind of the competitiveness of, of being somebody with cancer and how, you know, you go there and who's worse off than who? And one, because who gets the most pity? But then also, you know, I love this. I think this is very important. You know, you look around and they say there's a 20% chance of you living five years. And so the math kicks in and you figure that's one in five. So you look around and you think, as any healthy person would, 
I gotta outlast four of these bastards. So this is, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, what a lot of these books do is they look at cancer with a really realistic portrayal to say, I might feel guilty about feeling some of these things, but it doesn't change the fact that I actually do feel them and think them, and maybe, maybe I am looking around and seeing who else might go there. Um, and then I think there, there's just some really great things, and then, you know, this is also kind of gives a really uh, great tone to the book. I don't think you're dying, I said. I think you've just got a touch of cancer. So it's trying to kind of humanize that to make people feel like themselves and like they have a sense of identity that is beyond their diagnosis. And then there's the sadness of this, you know, which is sometimes it's impossible to find yourself beyond your disease and beyond your illness. Um, and I think there's also something about, you know, if you go down in a plane crash, there's glory if you do this. But if you're slowly dying of an illness, um, these are teens who aren't seeing the glory in that, who aren't seeing the power in that illness and in that death. And so, um, you know, I, I, this, this last quote, you know, if you were to go, and hopefully someday you will, you will see a lot of paintings of dead people. You'd see Jesus on the cross, and you'd see a dude get stabbed in the neck, and you'd see people dying at sea and in battle and a parade of martyrs, but not one single cancer kid. Nobody biting it from the plague or smallpox or yellow fever or whatever, because there is no glory in illness. There's no meaning to it. There's no honor in dying of it. So that's John Green Faulkner. So this is, this is going to be a real, if your kids haven't read it already, they will. Um, it's one of his strongest titles. And these are two characters that people are just falling in love with. And, um, and he, he handles a very, very difficult and painful topic in a very beautiful way. So who's read A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness? Oh my gosh, okay, so, so let me tell you about this book. This is, I love this book. Um, and uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story of how this book was written because I think it really, um, it really has relevance to what I'm talking about. So Siobhan Dowd, who was also a very um, famous and well-known YA author, Siobhan Dowd had the idea for this book and then she was diagnosed with cancer. And so Siobhan Dowd knew that she was not going to be able to live through the writing and creation of this book. So she spoke, you know, she spoke to her editor and her publisher and she said, I want this idea to live after me. And um, I would like you to find somebody who can continue this work for me. Um, and she did, she passed away. Um, she actually passed away right after writing Bog Child, and Bog Child won many awards after, after, even after she had passed away. Um, one other side note about Siobhan Dowd, she has a trust now, so any of the money that is, that any profits from her books goes to helping um, kids develop their literacy skills in disadvantaged areas. So she's, she's made a point to do really charitable work even after she passed away. So Patrick Ness took up the charge to write this book. He, she had notes. She had written, actually, some full chapters of this book. She had really sketched out some of the characters. But she, Patrick Ness was given full license to kind of take that and change whatever he wanted. So this book is, is a beautiful book, but it's also a really wonderful story and a really unique story, especially because it deals with the topic of cancer. And, there's, and there, it, that topic is connected to how it came about. So this is really um, a book about what's scarier, you know, living every day with fear or actually coming to accept the truth of what's going to happen to you. Um, this is the story of Connor, who's a young boy whose mother is dying of cancer. And every night, he has the same terrible nightmare. Um, one that he can't speak of to anybody. And then he is visited in the middle of the night by this ancient mythical yew tree that comes out of the graveyard and basically forces him, demands him to face what's happening. And Connor's reluctant. He doesn't know what's real. He doesn't know what's fake. He's not sure. Um, but he knows that his whole life is really in disarray. His grandmother's coming to live with them because his mother can no longer care for him. School, nobody talks about him because he's that kid, that kid who's got the dying mom. And um, instead of being supportive, he's kind of been shunned. And, and there's this idea of what's worse, to be shunned and spit on or to be absolutely invisible. And they play a lot with that idea. And that's really, really wonderful. Um, another thing, I've put some of the images from this book. Um, Jim Kay did the artwork for this. And it's this ink blotty, really powerful image of, of kind of chasing, you know, what's chasing you and, and that idea of almost, almost fear coming to life. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to read one quote from this. And um, you know that is not true, the monster said. You know that your truth, the one that you hide, Connor O'Malley, is the thing you are most afraid of. And so this is um, a book where 
Connor is, is, in, is in a lot of denial about what is, is happening. And he knows this monster is basically giving him a timeline. You know, I'm going to tell you stories. And, and at the end of these stories, you're going to tell me your story. And so Connor has this kind of unofficial timeline that this monster is holding him accountable to. And it's, and it's a story about rage, about destruction, and about what we do when we're faced with, faced with ultimate grief. And, and there's, a real, um, there's a real powerful connection with his mother who, who really says, like, it's OK if you can't say the things that I know you want to say. It's absolutely OK. So this is a beautiful, beautiful book. And um, I apologize for my irreverence in the bo bottom, but this is really what, what this book says. And, and Earl, and um, me and Earl and the Dying Girl is, is, has that sassy punch that is, you know, F cancer, basically. Like, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. You know, I, I, I'm washing my hands of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill it with humor. I'm going to do this. And um, me, Earl and the Dying Girl is a story of a young man and his friends, and they're kind of on the outskirts of popularity. They've figured out a way to just get by without connecting to anybody. And then, um, and then mom says, you've got you've to hang out with this girl. You know, she's dying. You've got to make this film about her. And, um, and the main character is wonderful. And he you know, says things like, if after reading this book, you come to my home and brutally murder me, I don't blame you. He's very self-deprecating the whole time. And so this is actually really his story and Earl's story. And the story of the dying girl is, is a secondary plot line. But um, it deals with it really with, with humor and, um, and a lot more of like, I don't want to go to that sappy place. I don't want to go to that sappy place where we're all feeling bad, we're all sad. I, you know, I don't want to deal with that. And so this, this kind of gives you, it's, it reads really true to a teenage experience um, where they're saying, you know, I don't want that. I, this, this lost crap, you can have it. I'm, it's not mine. It's not my deal. It's what, not what I want to talk about. Um, and I love, you know, th this book contains precisely zero life lessons. He's going to tell you that. And, and of course, does it actually contain life lessons? Yes, it does. It talks about a different way to heal and a different way to process. Um, but it's funny. It's, it's got that kind of off-the-cuff, um, tongue-in-cheek sensibility. So this is, this is a very readable book that kind of gets that grief process in under the radar um, in, a, in a really accessible way. So. That's us. Um, are there any questions before we, we go on? A couple things that I just want to say. Grace has tons of materials back here for you. We've got the booklets. We've got bookmarks. We've got posters. Um, tons of things back there. So feel free to take as much as you'd like. Um, read, interact, engage, enjoy. Also, feel free now through the website. You can suggest books to us that you'd like us to consider um, for the committee. We also have your students vote. Again, go right to Sue Monmini's website. And then I, we have those three positions we'd love to fill with some of you. And then also, if you have teens, please encourage them to apply. And you can contact me with any questions or contact Grace if you've got any questions or comments. And are there any, is there anything we can answer now for you guys? Yeah. I have some eighth years going into freshman year next year, and I'd try to get them into the GMBA. Yeah. Think, like, get reading at that level. What books would you suggest of this list at eighth grade level? Ooh. What books for our younger readers? What do you guys think? Definitely a monster calls. A monster calls, calls. For absolutely. Sure. School for Dangerous Girls? School for Dangerous Girls. Can't think of any Dark oh, Endeavor. Miss Peregrine's yes. Dark Endeavor. And, and Miss Peregrine's Home for Yeah, I've actually had a lot of history that. But so good. Miss Peregrine's, yeah, that's a good that's a good um, one to get into. Maybe Serafina. Serafina. Yeah. Oh, Serafina. Yeah, yeah. And Serafina, that might be one where you might just say like Read, read 50, get in there, you know? Because yeah. it's a long book. It's a little bit more intimidating lengthwise. But once you get into it, it's there, and it's exciting. So yeah. I think that's a good job. I think that's, yeah. Yeah. that's a great question. That's absolutely a great question. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Anything you're like so upset you see on this list? Or anything you're super excited to see <laughs> on the list? Is anyone mad that we didn't put on the list? I came in late. Did you? You must have talked about icon killers. Yeah, you did. What very else, quickly. What are people's takes on that? It was a very I hard push on the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, on the list. we were divided. We were. I think we did. We take off a book so we could put that on there. Well, that was one. Yeah, sometimes that was one. That was one of the books we chose. Kind of. Um, 
It was, and there's, like there was a lot stuff. of conversation about the level of violence in that um, and, and what we thought was appropriate. Um, and, it, and it is. It's one of those things that with YA literature, you always have this kind of dance that you play, which is, which is, is this contextually appropriate? Is it gratuitous beyond, beyond its context? And I think that's true for language. I think that's true for sexuality. I think that's true for violence. I think if it applies to what the plot is and it's done in a, in a way that, that reads true to what the characters would do, for me, that's kind of the litmus test. If I have no problem with violence or sex or language as long as it, as it seems appropriate for the character in the plot. Aren't these awards for 9 through 12? 9 through 12. Yeah, we're talking 17 Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and first, oh, some, of the, right. some of the books are right. on the lower end. And some right, books absolutely. Books and that's the thing is, you know, there are some books that throw it out there. And, you know, I'm, I know for me personally, I'm, I'm pretty open about stuff like that. Um, but I think, you know, if there was a book that it seemed like, oh, I'm going to throw this in to be graphic, to be really over the top, I think you would read that and you would see that and you would see that that intention wasn't kind of genuine and, and that's that's where, for me, I draw the line in the sand, so, yeah. When we saw it, it was a tough choice because we were all kind of grossed out, but we looked oh. at what like is on t what's on TV now, what are teens yeah. looking at reading and doing, reading and this this just fits right, right. in there. Just so right. Some of them might it. actually be reading the yeah. Dexter series and yeah. watching Dexter, and, you know, this is basically Dexter for teens. It's, yeah. it's the younger version of that, and so... Um, yeah, and, and again, there is mindfulness about those choices, but it is, you're right, they are, you know, 17 and 18 for a lot of them and, and what they're saying. I work in a school and some of the kids I see there, I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> could be like, this kid could be the father of the school. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really hard. I think that's, that's really hard because it's, do you, you know, do you consider those few kids who it could, it could be a challenging book for and it could be a book, or do you consider w what other kids might take from it too? You know, I had a parent who came in and um, I work in a public library and she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you have this book in the YA department. And um, it was a book and it was about school violence. And, and what came down to it was once we started talking, she had, she admitted that this, the kid that read it had some trauma history, and so there was a spe very specific challenge with this one kid in this book. And she goes, I would let any of my other kids read it. And so when I realized it was more specifically to one, one reader than it was to the mass of readers, you know, that, that was that. Yeah, and that, we didn't even touch on, though, that it's really talking about being other. Like, yeah. the kid is ostracized because his father was a serial killer. And I mean, I don't know if they all knew that he was sort of right. had some training or saw it all. But so I think that, like, being stigmatized, and this is just a very extreme case of being sure. stigmatized. So I think students know what that feels like, too. Um, yeah. And then they get excited because it's more like CSI and drama and cops. So there's a lot of other appeal. Can yeah. I just say it was my assistant, April Kelly, who actually brought the book to the attention. <laughs> <laughs> and April never reads anything, yeah. that, you know, about violence or whatever. Interesting. But she just loved it. And yeah. Well, and that's, that's what she likes. And that's something to be said, Grace. That's a great point. April, you know, I know April also, and April, d if I didn't know April didn't read horror because she said I hunt killers, and then she said you have to put Anna dressed in blood on there too. So these are yeah. books that are obviously being written well enough that they're expanding people's genre. So people who might not read horror, and and Matt, Matt's going to read really intense horror. He's going to read kind of the purest form of that genre, but these are kind of horror light and intro into that genre. So it's a great way. Yeah, you had a question. This is a really quick question. Oh, go for it. When did you when you publish the list for the fall, like the 2013-14? When did that come out? That came out um, mid March, okay. mid March. Yeah. So normally okay. um, we meet in mid March and then it gets published. You know, normally we have to do checks just to make sure. The checks are less now because we don't have to check about paperback availability. So it's normally a couple day turnaround. So it's normally yeah. A lot, and all these books are ebooks as well, right? Almost all of them, I think. And um, for if anybody does listen up Vermont, they're are they all free on Listen Up Vermont? Most of them are. Any that are available have been put on Listen Up Vermont. Okay. Yes. So, and, and it says on the first page. That's huh? huge. Yeah, Hannah Peacock, is, um, who's on DCF, is she's the one who does collection development for children's for Listen Up Vermont. So she double checks that anything on the book awards that are available in audio will be put on Listen Up Vermont. And that means audio and print. You can still follow along. On the Sun Vermont, can you follow along with the print too? Right. I don't think so. The, no, no it, it would be separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, e-books e and audio. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Right. Thing. But if it's on the list up for mod for audio, would it have be on the ebook for free too? Yeah, if they if oh, they yeah. can get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. They bought both. Or yes. That's what I'm saying. My kids could have it on yep. e-print or audio. Yep. That's yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. That's a great it's question. It's yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. I teach a course where the kids have to choose their own books, and I have, you know, 60 kids, and I can't, I don't have all the books to give them. Do you mean why not find Right, absolutely, right. So I, I don't like to put them on the bookshelf unless I know that they'll be able to get to them, you know, and I feel terrible saying you have to go buy it or, you know. Yeah. So if I know that they can get it for free, then it's much better for me. Yeah, that's a great question. Anything else from anyone? I loved what you said about these are books the kids should enjoy reading. And I've got this teacher who has his kids choosing these books, and they're all coming in and saying, this is the best book I've read in Mr. Bates' class all year. Oh. So, uh, he's nice. you know, it's really been very successful, and they've chosen you know, from the 30 this year and last yeah. all over the map. Good. Well, that's, you know, that's what's been great. And, and I think these past two years, we've done a really it's been our real focus to make sure that they are going to be picked up. You know, we will take a book that we think is so high quality and we'll look and we'll say, no one's going to read this. You know, it's going to be read by such a niche group of readers and, and it won't, that's a real priority. We want it to be something that a kid is going to pick up on their own independently that isn't going to have to be sold to them. And, and there's been some surprising favorites. You know, Machine of Death last year got tons of readership and it was this quirky little anthology of short stories. So, yeah, yeah. You didn't say it right. Oh, machine of death! There's also a phobia of short story. I'm teaching a high school 11, 12 elective yep. where you get full English credit for literally the entire semester. You choose all your books. Awesome. And you start and you finish them the whole time class. and you get just as much credit as someone else who's taking a classics course where you have yeah. to do it. And it's it has changed so many kids because some kids read eight books a semester right. and read five but they have to find their own books and and they're they're definitely sharing these ideas and it's just that it's not it's it's like their actual academic credit time and that's yeah. what they love about it is that they you know that's can do great, it during great. school and they yes. read 30 minutes out of the block every class that's so these wonderful. kids have read like 18 school? hours school South Burlington High School yes. and I created the course and it's just my that's second year awesome. teaching it and I mean the kids have said they've never finished a book before this class I mean because they have to read 30 minutes in class they have to provide their own book and I thought they'll never even come in with books they never don't have a book that's huh. awesome I mean and they go to the library or whatever the librarians have been amazing but that's this fabulous. is perfect and I haven't I haven't put this list in I gotta put this list up. I didn't put it up this year. I didn't realize and that's one of the hopes that we have too. Is Sue Monmany's website? We hope that yeah. we hope that students. It's more it's more accessible for students. It's ideal for teachers and librarians, but it's also far more far more easy to navigate for a student population. So if you have somebody doing some independent work, it would be a great resource for them. So and they could watch those little book trailers. They could go in. Making book trailers. Too. Yeah. Submit them. Submit them yeah. For sure. Well, yeah, I'll have to next year when they start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're done. So anybody, feel free to, if you have any questions, we'll stay around for a couple minutes, but feel free to... Um